Anybody went to sleep? Not much. Very short. That was a very short forty winks. Uh, anybody enjoyed the session? Oh, good. Anyone wants to share anything? Or ask any question or comment? Yes. I would like to know if um, the POM, what's the difference between that and Christ and Lord? No difference. Any other question, comment? Yes. Nothing happens. <laughs> <coughs> Maybe it's because I'm tense. Relax. I try. I try. Treat the body. Treat the body like it is a house. Don't treat the body like it's you. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. You're treating the body like it's you. Treat the body like it's a house with many floors. And you can have an elevator to go up and down the floors. Take a floor. Wherever you are in the body, take a floor to come to the sixth floor and jump off. When you jump off at the sixth floor, you will feel something happen. Next time, do that. I was afraid I was going to fall asleep. But do it consciously, wakefully, that you are taking an elevator going up and down the body, and then when you come to the eyes, jump off. I envy. I so envy anyone that can do it. And I want to do it. You can do it. You try again. Try this new new technique of traveling in the body and then jumping off behind the ice. Yes. Is it possible to do that with your eyes open and, and go into a level? Absolutely. After a while, you don't need to close the eyes because it is not the closing of the eyes that is creating the concentration of attention. It's only a beginner's exercise. Later on, you can keep your eyes open and be there. You can be walking and be there. Not only eyes open, you can be doing other activities and still be there. Yes. Much earlier, uh, you mentioned um, hearing light and seeing sound, or at least seeing sound. Uh, and I, I had an experience, not today, um, but a couple of years ago, and it's still very vivid in my mind, and I'd like you to comment on it, because I really don't, don't know what it was, not with any certainty. I have suspicions, but that's just my mind producing, uh, you know, lot, like semi-logical conclusions anyhow. I was listening to the sound, and what I saw on a, a background is like just space, like, but it was a dimensional background, very, very black, what could best be described as a laser light drawing the image of the Sanskrit Om, the, the, that letter. Uh, and it was coincident with, with the sound, and it seemed to me that there was a connection between the two. Could you comment on that? Yes, there is a connection between the two. I might uh, add here that these numbers, some characters of certain languages, in fact, uh, at certain stage, almost all languages, certain characters have an entity to themselves in the astral and sub-astral regions. Astral region is a very large region. All the ideas come from there. All languages are born from there. Numbers come from there. Mathematics comes from there. Colors come from there. Not only do they come from uh, a storehouse of this information, but they are forms, entities. Like in physical birth, we say a soul can take the form of a human being. Soul can take the form of a tree. Soul can be in a dog or a cat. In the astral region, a soul can be in the symbol represented by the scriptural writing of the letter O. So, soul can also be in a number, like seven. And you say, I am going to meet seven for breakfast today. It would be perfectly logical in the astral region. Because these numbers and lights have an identity of their own. And therefore, sometimes you can see music in its form of an identity, which is visible. You can see sounds which are visible. You can also see characters, which are written characters, especially of the certain languages which are used for original scriptures. You can see those letters like entities which are connected with the sounds. 
So your experience was not unusual that way. It's fully corroborated in the description of the astral region. So there's a special connection between that particular letter, the Aum symbol? Yes. Which is not, that's not just, that's but, not native to my background at all. No, but it is connected, it's connected to the kind of sound you heard. The kind of sound you hear. I don't even think I could draw that from memory, but I saw it. Yes. It, it cannot be easily drawn because it is stored in a way it can be drawn from there, but not uh, not written down easily. It cannot be written down easily because it is not merely it's not merely a character written on the blackboard. It's got an entity from which the sound emanates. The sound is linked with this, but the particular sound that emanates from there is that particular sound, and the sound that you hear, which you have heard even later than that, is connected with the same visible form. The sound is quite constant. It has been since September of 1986 when I was with you in a workshop like today. It never stopped for an instant. But the visuals, that was just a one-time thing. <clears throat> the sound is more important than the visuals. Thank God. <laughs> no, don't worry about the visuals. But as you go within and spend more time there, you'll see the connections between the visuals and the sound. Yes. You speak of transcending the ego. The only way to transcend the ego is true love and devotion to the beloved. It seems to be a little piece missing for me. I'm not even sure how to talk about it. When you talk about love and devotion to the beloved, you seem to be talking about the other. Would you talk a little bit more about the a piece in there that, that seems to me that should be there, and that is love and devotion to yourself beyond yourself. The true love and devotion to the self in, as, a, as a part of that whole uh, system. Stan, the difficulty is that the other you refer to or I refer to is the self. We made it the other. It is not supposed to be the other. The love and devotion for the self is what is needed. We do not know what the self is, so we make the self the other. We make the self the Lord to worship, but the Lord is the self. The self in its reality is the Lord, but we do not know it. We lost touch with that and therefore we have to create another. We create an illusion to overcome this difficulty of not recognizing the self. But in truth, love and devotion to the self is the one that we want to express. We are unaware of the self, therefore not to get lost in love and devotion to the mind, we create a reliable self, a reliable other. The reliable other is the perfect living master. Yes. If you are, if you're creating your master and you're developing love and devotion for your master, then a tendency comes for a great yearning to do something for the one you love. And how, how can you feel that because it makes you sad like you feel like you can't do it? You, you, what, what can you do for your master? Serve. Serve him if you can. If you can't, serve those who love him. If you can't find them, serve anybody. Service is the most immediately available form of expressing love and devotion. If you don't know how to express love and devotion, do service. Service is right available now at any time. Serve the master. Master is not available. Serve the beloveds of the master. The beloved of the master not available, serve humankind, serve anybody. And that service is an expression of love and devotion. Service is of three kinds, four kinds. Service is of four kinds. Service with the body, service with your wealth, service with your mind, service with your soul. Service with the wealth is the easiest part. We make a charitable donation, we write out a check and that's done. That's a good service, but has the least merit in the order of services. The next service is with your body. Then you can physically do something. If you see, if you've ever been to the Dera in India, great master, people are picking up the dirt and filling up the ditches for no other purpose except it gives them a chance to sing the songs and praise of the Lord and just put things here and there with their physical bodies. It's a very, very a beautiful way of taking care of the ego and developing love and devotion. So service with the body, 
is the next highest. Service with the mind, which is the meditational techniques we follow. Service with the mind is meditation. When you do meditation, it should not be done with a view to see the light to do something. If you try to see the light in meditation, you don't normally see it. But if you do it as service to the master, the light comes. And that's also a form of service. Service of the spirit is overflowing with love and devotion to the point you can't help loving everybody that you come in contact with. That's also service with the spirit. So if you do these four kinds of services which are available to at all times, you are really expressing your love and devotion for the master. Yes. So this is going back to the standstill. And I don't know, I think it's relevant. That sometimes if I feel an overpowering love for whatever it is that I'm feeling that overpowering love for, it is such a wonderful feeling that with it comes a gratitude that I'm able to experience that. And with that, I actually, the love turns inward as a loving of the experience and the capacity to feel that. And to me, that's loving itself. That's true. When you have the experience of love and devotion, you get filled up with love in return. And there is no greater fulfillment than being filled with love. If anybody has a better experience, tell me, I have not seen anything more satisfying, more gratifying, more fulfilling than the fulfillment of unconditional overflowing love going into you. And that kind of unconditional love we don't normally find in this world. It's very rare. But you find it all the time when you have a perfect living master. You find that unconditional love. Nobody gives unconditional love. But a perfect living master gives us unconditional love. He lays no condition whether we love him or not. And that feeling is very great. It's the best feeling we can have here. You are right. Anybody else? Explaining the difference between meditation and prayer or is there any? Prayer, prayer is good if you don't ask for anything. If you want your prayers to be answered, they are not strictly prayers. They are correspondence. You can correspond with God and say, God, please give me this. You wait for it. A good prayer is one where no answer is indicated. If you make a prayer totally without answer, it becomes meditation. Meditation is sitting in readiness for the same Lord to whom we are praying. So these are just different words and different degrees of our love and devotion for the Lord. Prayer is also a stance for love and devotion. But meditation to be of a true kind has to be meditation in a position of love and devotion, service to the Lord. And that's true meditation. It's, it's a deeper prayer. Well, I'm from Sandra country, and I, that's the reason I ask, because it's not for myself, but you know, how can we help to get our country out of this mess we're in? The more you get filled up with love, the more you will help. Okay. You get filled up with love, you will help everybody around you. We cannot really help others unless we are filled up ourselves. And when we are filled up ourselves, we help others whether we like it or not. It's automatic. Fill the cup, the overflow will go to people. But if you only got a few drops, say, I've got something in my cup I'm going to share with you, and you drop it, by the time you are giving the sample, you are empty yourself. So sharing should be when the cup is full. Anybody else? The back row? Dwight, were you raising your hand or scratching your head? Okay, let's have now a session in which we not only visualize the <coughs> beloved. I hope you are, it's, there's no problem visualizing the beloved. You visualize the beloved and you use your mind to speak out a prayer, like she says, a prayer, a, 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 a conversation, not to ask for anything, but just to praise just to praise the beloved, to say how grateful you are to be able to see this wonderful experience, just to express gratitude and to praise how great it is. 
I might mention here that one of the great mystics in India, in one of his poems, says, if we have not praised the Lord in our life, we have wasted our life. <laughs> he thinks this is the most important thing. He says, if we waste our life if we don't praise the Lord. Either the Lord needs a lot of praise, or maybe it's a good means to develop devotion in ourselves. But surely it was given very high importance to praise the Lord and to be grateful for what we are getting are two means of developing devotion. We are going to use them in this next session that when you see the Lord and his face, your beloved. When I say Lord, it, it, it can be perfect living master, it can be the Lord, it can be a friend, it can be anybody you love. But it should be out of emotion and deep love and not feeling of attachments and so on. So anything that has pure love in it, put the figure in front and say a prayer in praise of the beloved, in gratitude for what you've got. We're going to try that as a means of evoking more devotion in our hearts. Close your eyes. Start again. Please close till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Feeling okay? How many are feeling okay still? Oh, good. Nobody is passed out yet. <laughs> any, anybody had any beautiful experience? Good, good. You don't have to share. But digest, digest it so it becomes the foundation of more such experience. The more you digest these experiences, the more you will have, it becomes a foundation for more experience. But if anybody wants to share something or raise a question, you are welcome to do so. Any question or any comment? Yes. Um, regarding something I've been aware of for a long time, and it's just like really wonderful to re experience it in its depth and profundity. And, and what it is, it's the direct experience of the conviction of the fact that uh, regardless of whether or not I'm worth it, and I really don't, you know, when the truth is told, I really don't think that I'm worth it. Uh, God, the master, whatever we, I want to call him, my, uh, my beloved, won't let go of me, and he's ever present, no matter how stupid I am, no matter what a fool I make out of myself, no matter how much I talk, uh, no matter how down on myself I would be, he's always there, and it fills me with this this bizarre emotion like it's the opposite of much of the complaints I see in the world most mostly people say God why me when things are bad and here I am and I just feel so incredibly blessed God why me what did I do to deserve this um, why is he so good to me uh, I mean I see so much suffering out there and I I don't I, I can't know that these people deserve it or don't deserve it but I surely don't feel that I deserve what I've got, and it's just such an overwhelming experience, um, like that, oh, I don't know the background of the story, it might be Japanese or Zen, where the, the father and the child are going through the rice field, and uh, if the child is holding onto the father's hand, the child could let go, and the child will let go, because he's going to be distracted, but the father's not going to let go of the child's hand, and that's the way I feel, I forget, I forget the beloved, I forget the master from time to time, I only wish I had a billionth of the devotion for him that he has for me. Um, and that's, that's what overwhelms me. It's the truth. What you speak is the truth. What a master. That's the truth. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for bringing it all on again. Anybody else? Yes. The meditation was very beautiful for me. It was also too short. Did anybody else feel it was too short? I felt it was too short, but it's just a workshop, it's not a regular meditation. Wish we had longer meditations. You would see, didn't you feel that I call these numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 too early? Yeah, yeah I know, I, I could see, but which is a great sign. I'm so happy, people say it's hard to meditate. And here, here how blessed we are that you like to meditate. I'm telling you, I was watching and I was emotionally filled up by the amount of 
spiritual seeking that is at this time present in this room. I have been very much filled up. I have been pleased to see the quality of the sheep that are ready to be picked up by the shepherd, go home. They are highly qualified people sitting here. I thought, he is right. We don't deserve what we are getting. But to write up and to recognize that we are so picked up and to be grateful for it makes us apart from anybody else. This gives us strength to face anything else. Once you can be grateful for what you are getting, you get the strength to face the difficulties which are bound to come because of our own karma. Let us not fool ourselves that we are in this world only for merrymaking. We are in this world for the ups and downs of our own karma. We are in this world to face some tough situations. We are in this world to go through suffering too, along with our joys. So this kind of gratitude, this kind of experience with the Lord helps us to go through those periods without the suffering that we would normally go through. It's a great thing. The world is ups and downs, but we go through it beautifully. Then we have this down of an attitude of devotion and gratitude in our heart. Yes. What you say is very true, but it's always easier under these circumstances than if you were here. I've heard that before, but but I hope that does not mean that you will not do it when I'm not here. No, <laughs> please continue your meditation. Continue the different things that you pick up in your own time. I know that some of these experiences that we get in these workshops are almost like bit of a grace, you know, coming besides what we would normally get. Does anybody get that feeling or only I get that feeling? Oh boy, that is... It is true that we get a sampling of something more than we get by ourselves when we are alone. But that's the advantage of getting together again and again. Some people feel like, uh, what are we getting? We meet again. What have we learned? Like John was telling, John Scalise was saying yesterday, it's an irony that having heard the truth and known the way, we still come back to the workshop, which means we have, we have not learned what we, what we learned first time. Well, that's also partially true, that we don't practice what we decide in these workshops to, to practice. Whatever we decide, whatever we hear, if we go back and practice that at home, we would be so different in our life. But we generally leave a lot of that stuff here and go back into our mundane world and then we get busy with all those things and when the next workshop comes up we are all assembled again in a spiritual atmosphere and we start all over again. That part is right. But the other part is right too. That what we get in some of these places, we long for them. We want to get them again. We can't get enough of them. So that is why the perfect living masters have recommended that there should be satsang. That means Association with the truth, which means associate with your master, associate where truth is being spoken. Sit there where truth is being spoken because that will keep your seeking alive and will not let your mind interfere to the extent of bypassing the real thing and getting into the worldly mundane things which ultimately on the day of death we'll find was all trash anyway. We don't realize that all this what we are giving attention to is one day just going to be left here, serving no need of ours. Even the people we think are so close to us and who love us and hug us and feel so close, when we leave this body, they will shy away from the body. It's a dead body. It becomes a carcass. The same person. And the change takes place so quickly. The same, the change is so quick and so sudden. It surprises us. There was a mystic named Kabir. He was a great mystic. I mentioned at lunchtime that he was one of those mystics who came three times according to his own narrative, according to his own story he told, which is recorded by his disciple. He said, Dharamdas, that was the name of his disciple. Dharamdas, if we look for qualified disciples, we don't find many. I came three times in this world before in the form of so and so in that year. And I walked about all over. I was fully enlightened. I came deliberately with light with me. 
I didn't have to work my way up. I came to see where are those qualified disciples waiting for me. I couldn't find any, so I left. Once I left, twice I left, three times I left, fourth time I've come and now my name is Kabir. This time I decided whether they are qualified or not, I must pick them up and take them. So we can't wait for qualification. But that Kabir was such an enlightened person. Somebody once went to see him in his little cottage. A person was in dire need of meeting an enlightened soul. So they heard that Kabir is the one. So he went to Kabir's house and uh, Kabir was not there. So he asked the other people, where is Kabir? They said he has gone to attend a funeral, a cremation. Somebody has died. So he's in the uh, cemetery at the cremation grounds, crematorium. And uh, you can go and find him. He said, how will I find him? He says, because he always thinks of God. So there's a light on his head, which you can see shining, because whoever thinks of God, that light is shining. You'll find him straight, because not too many people think of God. So this man went to the funeral grounds, and he saw the cremation had taken place. There were hundreds of people assembled. Must be a popular guy who died. And then he saw so many people with lights on their heads. So he couldn't find out who was Kabir. So as the funeral services ended and they started walking out, the lights began to fade out. When they left the gate, very few lights were left. By the time they were a mile away, only one light was left. And he knew that was Kabir. When we go to see somebody dying, we all think of God. It doesn't last too long. We just walk away after a funeral and then we are back to the same world, mundane world, and we forget God. So the story is simple that we need something to constantly keep us on track. And satsang, the gathering of people for the sake of truth, is one of the good devices. So, John, don't worry if they come again and again. They get, they get some benefit even by coming again and again. The door, it's, a, it's a good practice even, even otherwise to meet. Satsang does not mean a formal workshop. It does not mean a formal discourse. It does not mean going to a particular place. Satsang means whenever two people think of the beloved, it is satsang. Whenever any group talks of the love and devotion, it is satsang. So that kind of satsang is recommended. Satsang is like a fence to protect our fields. When we plant something, we put a fence so that the raccoons and monkeys and others don't come and attack it. In our field, spiritual field, we try to put so many little, little things to grow into beautiful spiritual flowers. But there are so many temptations and the invasions take place by other monkeys and raccoons in the mind. They come and try to destroy our crop. So we need the fence of the satsang of frequently meeting and praising the Lord so to protect our crop and get some benefits. I'm just using some uh, Indian similes which we use there. Anything else you'd like to share? That I want to tell you how pleased I am with this workshop and with the experiences that you had here, which showed up on your face. And I, I, I know that you are all marked sheep and that you have been picked up so that you can go on the spiritual path and achieve higher states. For a long time, for a long, long time, the West has been denied certain experiences which we thought were almost confined to the East. These gurus and mystics, they all seem to come from there, either Middle East or East or Far East or China or why not from the United States of America? Why not the West? Why should only be people who believe in a general spirit be here? People who believe in rituals be here? People who believe in ceremonies be here? Why can't we find people here who go within and go to the highest regions and come up and tell us, go within, don't go after rituals? We don't find them here. Looks like the tables are turning. It looks like more and more people who are going to have, uh, if they are not already having these inner experiences, are going to be on this part of the planet. This is a great shift. Spiritual access is shifting and I can see it. In truth, 
I have myself immigrated to this part of the world to be on the ringside seat when the big show takes place. The big spiritual show is going to take place here in this area. And those people who are ready for the seeking, ready for that experience, are the kind of people who really want love and devotion and seeking. And they want to look for a perfect master, perfect living master. The desire to find a perfect living master who is a perfectly true friend in whom you can have 100% trust is a growing desire in this part of the world. The shift is also taking place in the sense that all the shift, all the desire to make money, to build, build houses, that's going over there in the east. They are busy building factories, buying more automobiles, more cars, improving their standard of living, trying to become like the Americans. Well, the Americans say, we've seen enough of this BS. We want to get to the real stuff now. We want to get some real stuff. And we want to see the truth. We had enough of this. And the truth is that if you didn't have enough of it, you wouldn't really be so anxious to see the other thing. So having seen all this, now we are ready in this part of the world. And I'm very happy that I am today with a group that represents the pioneers in that kind of experience. And I'd like to congratulate you on your seeking, on your uh, spiritual tendency, and on the fact that you are on the spiritual way. I give you my best wishes and prayers, and God bless you. And those who are waiting for initiation, I hope you'll get initiation soon, and get linked, and experience all the things that I was talking about, so I don't have to talk anymore. <laughs> Our workshop should be that we just get into that. And no need to talk, no need to verbalize. We just get into it. I hope that stage will come. At least you will find a number of us able to do it, not a few. I remember my own master's days. To sit with the great master, such a beautiful experience to be there. And then we could see some other people there. We could see who was where. And we knew that many of them knew exactly that they were home. If we remove all this delusion and illusion from our minds today, we will realize we are back home. So where are we right now? Where is the paper gone? We are right at home, but under the illusion we are not. The moment we get away from this illusion, by proper meditation, faith, love and devotion, we'll know we are back home. And thank you very much for participating in the workshop.